clerk will ring the bell. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have one more appearance in the well on a point of personal privilege. It's a very special one. All of them are special, but this is extra special. Because three participants, starting with Mr. Holland, and Mr. Teeper, and then Mr. Poston. They're going to share their 10 minutes. Chair recognizes Mr. Holland. Mr. Speaker, members of the House suffer something completely different on a point of personal privilege this morning. I've only taken one personal privilege in eight years, and I, I want to take a, a minute and ask your indulgence and your courtesy to listen and pay attention as I talk to you about a friend of mine. It's hard to believe it. It's been eight years since... Uh, Doug Teeper and I and Ron Fennell and Ken Poston came to the legislature. And in a few minutes, my great friend Ken Poston is going to come up here and talk with you about his plans and his future away from the Georgia General Assembly. And I just, I felt it would be totally improper if I didn't come up and share a few ideas with you. Because our families, Ken's family and my family, have shared an apartment and been roommates for the last six years in the General Assembly. And when I think about it, there are very few people I've been around in my life as much as Ken. Uh, college roommates you have for four years. I've only been married for five years. Um, and almost every day in lunch, every time I've walked onto the chamber, every time I've left the chamber, in the last eight years, Doug and Ken and Ron and I have been together. A lot of times during the last six years, we have shared good times. We have shared bad times. We were in each other's weddings. When my daughter was born, he came to South Georgia to visit with us. I visited him in difficult times when he had tough times with diabetes in the hospital. And on a lighter note, I guess in the last six years, we have pulled more practical jokes on each other than I could possibly explain in the time I have here. But I guess I couldn't say it better or couldn't say it more simply than to say Ken is family. He's a part of our family. He's like another brother. A little girl calls him Bubba, in fact. I don't know where she got that from. But let me take a few minutes, and I hope in tribute to his service in the General Assembly, you'll give me your attention as we share a few ideas about him. He perhaps is the person I have met in my life that has the best personal skills, the best people skills I've ever seen. He shows people that he's concerned with their lives, and time and time again I've seen him do that to the biggest person and to the smallest person, and I've seen the results and I appreciate those results, and those people have appreciated that. He has unmatched tenacity. The best way I can tell you about that is that when my daughter was born, and I mean when my daughter was born, we were in the delivery room. She had just been born. We were rolling out of the delivery room, and there was a phone on the wall, and the phone rang, and it was Ken who had worked his way through the hospital maze to congratulate us right there. And I've seen that, that tenacity time and time again the kind of surprising tenacity uh, that, that he showed with that effort. And if you'll, if you'll allow me one slight partisan moment here, no matter how you may think about a congressional race in the future, if you know him and you know his tenacity, then you know his opponent and the speaker in Washington just can't imagine what they may have in store for him in the coming months. He's a courageous person. He's a courageous person, perhaps even to a fault, I might think. He reminds me of a saying of another congressman from just north of Ringgold many hundreds of years ago, Davy Crockett, who said, first be sure you're right and then go ahead. And most of the tough issues that he's handled from this well have been issues that started with one of his constituents. And once he was convinced that he was right, he hung on regardless of the consequences to himself. And most of the time he won. But perhaps the greatest thing I've seen and the best thing I've seen, that he perhaps has the greatest sense of humor that I've ever seen. Sometimes I think, personally, and I'm sure you agree, I have a tendency to be too serious about things. But Ken can come by even in the toughest times and make me fall out of my chair laughing. And I think that's probably what I'll miss the most next year. Finally, in trying to, th I, you know, you realize that sometimes you serve with people in the General Assembly and you just don't know them. And I was trying to think of some way to make a point to you about this, and I thought of a a book I read in college by J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, Ms. Mayretta and Ms. McBee knows who that is if you don't know. 
And there was a story of, a, of that was a story about a great journey by a band of travelers. And at one point, when the travelers began complaining about the main character of the story, the group's leader stopped and said this. He said, you may not know or understand him well. He's not the biggest or the strongest. But above all, I tell you this. He has a great heart. And before this journey is over with, you will be thankful that he came along with us. And in the end, it was this character that brought great honor to this group and caused that journey to be a great success. And I believe Ken has that kind of great heart. He has brought honor to this house by his service. I believe that this house and those people who have served with him are better for having had him along. And it's always hard to talk to him wherever he's sitting because he's so far over there to the right just in front of the GPT TV cameras over there. But I want to say to you, Ken, that as your eight-year journey in the House of Representatives comes to an end and you embark towards other goals, I want to say first that I'm a little bit tempted to try to come with you and see how Congress looks in the 2nd Congressional District. You, 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 you think about you might need a roommate up in Washington. But then when I think about that, two things occur to me. I've got a daughter that needs me at home, and number two, somebody's got to stay here and take care of Doug Teeper. So I'll try to stay here. But let me say in closing that it's been fun and that I am and always shall be your friend and that I hope that your accomplishments at our Capitol, <laughs> at our Capitol in Washington, on behalf of the people of our nation, will be just as impressive and notable as your service to the people of Georgia from this well and in this chamber and under the dome of our state capitol. Ken, good luck to you. And Mr. Speaker, I yield the well to Mr. Teeper. All right. Well, you used half your time, sir. Now, Mr. Teeper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, uh, I, too, come up here to speak about our friend Ken Poston. I want to talk just a second about political style. Each and every one of us have a style that we carry with us. Each of us is an individual. We have our different ways of expressing ourselves. My understanding of politics is there's two ways to simplify it. One is to go along, to get along. And then there's another way. It's to be an individual, to express yourself, to take on the unpopular battles, to go down the road not traveled. I'm up here just to say thank you. I, it was a pleasure, an honor, and a privilege to serve with my colleague. He's an example for each and every one of us to be an individual, to have your own style, to go forward to set goals, to try to make a difference. And Ken, you have made a difference. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats, those along the wall and in the back. Please take your seats, everyone. Have a seat, members. Against the walls in the back. Preacher, have a seat. Chair recognizes a gentleman from North Georgia. A gentleman from the third, Mr. Poston. My two colleagues preceding me, uh, don't be, a, don't be a misled. That was not a before and after picture for the hair club for men. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and members of the House and members of the uh, press corps and visitors. And uh, I'm going to go by script here just to stay on track and try to get us back to business today. Uh, in 1989, when I first walked in this room, uh, there is a depression, uh, as you know, as the room elevates. Uh, the first thing I did was trip. <laughs> Some folks say I never really righted myself, but. Uh, Today, uh, most likely, will be my last turn in the well, and I take leave of you and ask 
for your blessings for my next endeavor. Over the past several days, I've tried to speak to every one of you, and thank you for being a part of my experience here. Uh, when I started saying those goodbyes over in the corner with uh, Emery and, and, and John Godby, I, I really realized that saying goodbye was not as easy as I'd expected. Then, uh, by the time I got around to my eight-year home over here in Section A, it, it really never got any easier. But uh, many of you have, uh, have given me strength and told me that, uh, that I am leaving on the best of terms, and those, those are my own. And I wish for you the opportunity to know when your last days in this chamber occur so that you can say all the goodbyes and shake the hands of some of the best people you'll ever know, friend and former bitter foe, I say former, and have the benefit of this perspective to realize it and to give yourself some sense of closure for this experience. You will gain and grow from it. Mr. Speaker, I know Mr. Speaker Murphy is somewhere in the building and uh, I wanted to tell him the, the Chinese have a curse. May you live in interesting times. I think that's not a curse necessarily, but rather a blessing. In that respect, I'm proud to have helped bring to you, Speaker Murphy, some of the most blessed moments in your life and uh, in the history of this place. And now I belatedly thank you for some of the, uh, what I now understand were some of the blessings that you uh, caused me to have. And uh, the blessings of interesting times. And in, in truth, Speaker Murphy, you've given me better preparation for the road ahead than you will ever know. And I tip my hat to you. Thank you. As difficult as I made it for all of you sometimes, a, a few of you in here really kept the faith with me with a lot of quiet encouragement when you really were the, at the most at risk for giving it. And you're too many in number to acknowledge here and now. But I really am talking about the security guards, the secretaries, the staff, the assistants, the doorkeepers, the interns, the aides, the legislative council people, and many of you in the hallway. Many of you gave encouragement when it was the last thing I was expecting to get from you, particularly from those of you who were in the unfortunate position of having no choice but to work with me. And I tip my hat to Shirley, Sharla, Candy, Alva, Angie, and Martha, the greatest secretaries a troublemaker could ever have. And of course, they're the members. I still hesitate to identify a few of you because uh, you might get in trouble. But I, I got to say something about the, the Reform Caucus. You know who you are. We'll meet in the usual place at the usual time. Dubose, Jeanette, Paul, the two Toms, the two Henriettas, and se several others. Net, let no one tell it differently. We made a difference here. I, I, I got to tip my hat to the greatest working relationship of a legislative delegation me and Mike Snow, the Catoosa County delegation. I don't know of any county delegation that has ever gotten along so well over so long a time through local legislation and different things. And, and wherever Judy Pogue is, Judy was part of that Catoosa delegation for a while, and I, I tip my hat to him. And, and we've had some comments today about uh, other members. I want to thank my chairman for tolerating me, for having faith in me, and for putting up with me. Of all the members that I've been closely associated with, though, there are a few I hope to honor with my words today for our friendship, our shared experiences, and our times. First, the class of 88. We were small in, in number, but we were pretty strong in this chamber, I think. Uh, former Representative Ron Fennell, now, this is a guy whose politics oozes through every pore, and I've never known anybody who loved it better or who practiced it, practiced it as well. My friend Doug Teeper, did anybody ever think a Jew and a Methodist could cause so much trouble together? So many nights and days, Doug and I have enjoyed analyzing politics over at Neil Herring's or Manuel's or somewhere. And you, you will not find a more learned member of this house, nor a more valuable one to this body. I think, in a sense, Doug and I have had a little friendly unspoken competition over the years. 
who could get in the most trouble here or anywhere else. Many of you were in the grocery store recently, might have picked up a copy of this tabloid, only to find inside U.S. politicians' shocking demand, guillotine death row inmates. <laughs> With Doug Teeper on the inside. This is right across the page from the leopard man, the half man, half leopard who terrorizes Nairobi. Doug, I can't top this. I gotta leave. And of course, Ray. No, no, Ray Goff. <laughs> I gotta tell you this story. Four young legislators came here in 1989. We wanted to be such a part of this place and a part of the, the team. We, we were just so excited when one day the speaker invited us to lunch. We all crammed in the back of the big Crown Victoria, and we're heading down the road, and the speaker, in his usual aloofness, looked over at Butch and said, I'm going to take Ray fishing. We all kind of sunk back in our chairs while Ray Holland leaned up and said, Where are we going, Mr. Speaker? And he turned around and he said, I meant Ray Goff. Ironically, when we were talking about people running for Congress in South Georgia, I got him again. I said, Ray, the speaker was talking about getting Ray to run for Congress. And he said, really? What district does he want me to run in? I said, no, Ray Goff. <laughs> Ray Holland is the best example of courtesy, conscientiousness, and constituent service I have ever seen at government at any level. On the other hand, uh, I room with him, and he... His, his vice is he sits up all night drinking chocolate milk watching Mr. Ed reruns. You decide whether good government is worth this terrible cost. Seriously, Ray is a, the brother I never had growing up, and I thank him. But I hesitate to dwell on the fraternity spirit that so easily develops here from the high pressure and the shared experiences and camaraderie. I've always feared that it distracts us from and competes with the allegiance to our districts. And in truth, I have resented and damned it more than I've ever enjoyed or benefited from it. But I must admit now today that I really realize now that I was part of it all along. I guess the most healthy perspective I'll leave here with is the notion that the great state of Georgia, the General Assembly, and this House will stand long after you or I are faded from its memory. It will certainly survive my absence, and believe it or not, it will survive yours. The truth is this House of Representatives is collectively stronger than any one of us individual members, no matter who that person is or how powerful. Finally, after eight years in this body, if you'll indulge me another minute or two, there are a few things you still don't know about me. And although I'm often and in the picture book and by everybody's uh, association, mentioned as hailing from Ringgold, Georgia. I'm originally from a much smaller town, uh, up where the South Chickamauga Creek cuts through the Peavine Ridge and just about to go into Tennessee. And that's where you'll find Graysville. Now, Graysville hasn't changed much since I was born. As a matter of fact, it hasn't changed much since 1849. But uh, it has oh, just over 100 residents on a, on a good day. And uh, its heart is a small country store uh, known as the Graysville Mercantile, and the proprietors of the Brown Brothers. And they've operated the store for almost 50 years. The store was the absolute center of my universe for most of my childhood. It's a place where I stayed warm while waiting on the school bus. It's where my dog waited on me till I got back off the school bus. It's where the bookmobile came to town every summer and stopped. And it's where everybody in town went that had a hand in my raising and very often a hand in my correction. This is where members of the town still gather and discuss current events, the state and the county and the nation. Perhaps just like in your town, I know you have a place like this, but there is and, and was and is something special about Graysville to me. 
as a boy, I'd watch the brothers down at the store that give what we call the treatment to visiting politicians. And that is to mock and intimidate and grill them mercilessly. One time they even pulled a gun on one. They held back no punches and, and often had the effect of sending these people running out the door, one time in tears. This has always been a high entertainment for us in Graysville, but it's always meant a little more to me because, you see, eight years ago, I started having been to be the subject of that treatment. And I had to start justifying my own service to some of the toughest but most important critics in my world. Overall, the treatment of the Graysville Mercantile is a manifestation of an old North Georgia spirit that, that does live on today. It, it, it's a tradition that thrives throughout the Georgia mountains all the way from Lookout and Sand Mountain all the, way, all the way to Tacoa. And if I could read you a letter that I think tells a little about how long this spirit has been up there. This is a letter I found in a book to Governor George Joseph Brown from a man named James Aiken in Walker County, February 15th, 1861. You know what was happening in our nation in 1860 and 1861? Governor Brown got this letter that said, Dear Sir, we the people of Walker and Dade and Catoosa County, Georgia, do not intend to submit to decision of the secession movement, which has been taken out of the hands of the people, has fallen into the hands of the demagogues and office seekers, pickpockets and vagrants about the towns and the cities and the railroads and the depots, and they have got nothing at stake, only a deck of cards, a quart of rot gut, and a cigar stuck in their mouths. If South Georgia wants to leave the Union, let her go. But we, the people of Cherokee Territory, want to stay in the Union. So I hope you'll let us go in peace and we'll set up for ourselves and remain in the Union. If not, we'll try what virtue there is in flint and steel. We have 2,500 volunteers now, their names enrolled. They're sworn to stand to each other, their lives, their property, and all we have to support each other. We want the Chattahoochee to be the line north and south. If we can't get it one way, we know how we can get it at the point of the bayonet and the muzzle of the musket. We are just as willing as you ever seen mountain boys. We know we have some that will be against us. We know how to take care of them. We have the right to leave the south as much as the state has to rebel against the union. If the people of Georgia will vote to go out of the Union, we'll submit to it as cheerful as ever you've seen. And if it's not brought back to the people, we will fight it as long as there are men to fight. Let the people have a vote on it. If they say so, we'll go, but not until then. I hope you'll consider well what we've written to you. That's the spirit in North Georgia that has made this region, made that region slow to the idea of leaving the Union Ironically, it made the region slow the idea of coming back to the Union as well. Dade County, we only got it back in in 1946. We are not too quick up there to jump on a bandwagon. We're more than a bit suspicious of authority. We're outright rebellious at times. Overall, we're generally stubborn as hell. And on any given meaningful position, we would rather fight than switch. Hopefully, this will explain much about my eight years here. Hopefully, it will explain much about my decision to move on to other challenges. A friend of mine says, if you don't remember where you came from, how do you know where you're going? Funny thing is, when I first got elected, the flattery of office and the sometimes unreal world of the state capitol almost made me forget where I came from. It took a couple of direct shocks to my political and physical systems to get my attention. The Lord does work in mysterious ways. These principles have sometimes got me in a hot water here. Sometimes I know the circumstances have made it difficult for you to even speak to me, much less support me at times, at least in public. Please know that I understand how things work around here, and I leave you with absolutely nothing but the best of feelings and no grudges for every member here. But in the end, you must know that while I may not have pleased you, I have passed with flying colors at the Graysville Mercantile. So in April, I will launch my candidacy for the U.S. Congress from the front steps of the Graysville Mercantile.
from there, I'll go from Graysville to Gainesville, from Trenton to Talking Rock to Tacoa, from Clayton to Cumming to Canton, and all points in between. I ask for your prayers and support that I keep the proper perspective and the grounding that you've given me, that I keep these friendships that have given me a constant sense of support and a regular dose of those blessings of reality that I told you about. And in leaving, I challenge you to find and get reacquainted with your own Graysville Mercantile store. It's a place in your heart that will hold you to the highest accountability. This all being said and done, I now bid you farewell and the most respectful thank you to one and all. When you get your house portrait in the lower right-hand corner of that official uh, photo, you'll find the shorter version of this speech. It's a little sign that says goodbye right on the front of my desk. Doug, I just had to do that. God bless you, God bless your families, and God bless the state of Georgia. Mr. Speaker, I now yield this well. Thank you, Ken. We wish you a great amount of luck and Godspeed from all of us here in the Georgia House. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have one more group by resolution. As soon as uh, we have one or two goodbyes here, we'd like to hear from Mr. Gerald Green. We'll pause for just a moment. To our guest from, from, with Mr. Gerald Green, I hope you are witnessing some of the comradeship, the friendship that members here in this house develop over a long period of association with friends from all over the state. This is a very important moment to all of us that one of our colleagues will be leaving us at the end of this session and headed for hopefully greater things. Mr. Poston is announcing his candidacy for United States Congress. In just a moment, we will get Mr. Gerald Green to come to the podium and introduce some very fine young people. Ladies and gentlemen, in the line for Mr. Poston, would you uh, please do get your pictures very quietly while Mr. Green introduces these fine young people. Everyone else on the floor, please have a seat except those in line. Everyone on the floor, find a seat all along the walls. Would you all find a seat back in the back? Oh, under the screen, find a seat.
those in line, please do it as quiet as possible because these are very fine young people. Would you hold the conversation down in the, in, in the line, please? Everyone in the line. I do. I sure do. Mr. Green, Gerald Green has a very important group by resolution. <laughs> 